Hello and welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner covering Sergey Lang's Basic Mathematics and we are in chapter 13, section 2, and this is polynomial functions. And if you've looked at this chapter before my video, which, you know, I highly encourage you to do that. This is a fairly long chapter with only a few exercises. Um, so I might break this video up into multiple sections, okay? All right, let's talk about functions, some particular functions, some interesting functions. We're going to talk about polynomial functions. What a polynomial function is, is the polynomial function defines for x the values a0 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x to the 2 plus a3 x to the 3 going all the way up to a to the n x to the n. Okay? And you might want to think of this as x to the 1, this is x to the 0, x to the 0 is just 1, x to the 1 is just x. So this is basically how we define polynomials. You'll note that in the book he writes this backwards in the way I write it. I prefer this method. It looks a little cleaner to me. Okay? It's a little easier to count from 0 all the way up to n. Okay? As an example of a polynomial function, he has the function that for each x, it's defined as 1 minus 2x plus 3x squared. Nope, 3x cubed, right? And so in this case, the a0 is 1, a1 is minus 2, a2 is 0 because there's no x squared term, and then a3 is 3, okay? That's a polynomial function. And if we were to evaluate this function at 1, we would get 1 minus 2 plus 3, so we would get the value 2. Okay, so this is that function. It's defined to be this way. That's what it does. Okay, as another example, let's use a different color here. Ooh, blue. I don't use blue very often. So we're going to define g. I'm going to write it out this way. And what it does is it takes x and it maps it out to the values 5 minus x plus 3x squared plus 1 half x to the fourth. Again, I'm writing it out backwards compared to the book. And again, there's our a0 term, our a1 term, this is our a2 term, and this is our a4 term. So we don't have an a3 term. Okay, a3 is 0. Okay, and if we evaluate g at 2, this is equivalent to, well, we have 5 minus 2 plus 3 times 4 plus 1 half x to the 4 would be 16. Okay, so 5 minus 2 plus 12 plus 8. So we have 25 minus 2, so 23 is what this evaluates to. Okay. Now, a polynomial written out up to the nth term like this, so there's no more terms after the nth term, we're going to say that the degree is less than or equal to n, okay? So this could have a degree n, or it could have a degree n minus 1, or it could have a degree 0 or degree 1. Just because we can write this out doesn't mean that this polynomial has a degree of n, okay? It can't have a degree more than n, but it could have a degree less than n, or it could have a degree equal to n, okay? One of the issues with polynomials, and the reason why we can't say it has a degree equal to n, is because there's a possibility that there's some other combination of constants that we multiply each of these terms by to rewrite this polynomial in a different way. Okay? For instance, suppose that, and he has this complicated formula, he says, what if we have 7x to the 5th minus 5x to the 4th plus 2x plus 1 is equal to x to the 6th? minus 17x cubed plus x plus 1, right? Do we know that this is equal, right? And his assertion is that while in this case it's pretty fairly obvious to just try a bunch of values and test it, when we have very large degrees, when we have very complex coefficients, it could be quite difficult to evaluate whether or not these two things are in the same, okay? Now, if we are to say that yes, they could be equivalent, then we're going to have problems right? Because then we have multiple definitions for f of x, and we really can't put an upper bound on what n could be, right? Uh, for the degree, right? But if we say, no, these are not the same, which we're going to prove using theorem 2, 
then we can say that there's definitely an upper bound to the degree. Okay, and indeed, and indeed we'll put a lower bound to the degree as well. Next slide. All right, let's talk about a root, right? Remember, I was taking a practice SAT examination with my son, and they asked what the roots were, and I was like, oh, what's a root? I forgot what a root was. A root of f are values of x such that f of x is equal to zero, okay? So typically we use the word, uh, the letter c for root, okay? So we have f of c equals zero, means that c is a root. Note that we're not saying that for all values of f, we get zero. We're saying that for particular values of f, it will be zero, right? Obviously, if f of x is a polynomial, then when we rewrite this and put the parameters in and the coefficients, we're going to get back zero. But the definition for f is definitely not zero, okay? It's not zero for all values of x. All right, let's give some examples of roots. So we're going to say let f of x, so f of x is defined to be um, the value such that x is mapped into x squared minus 3x plus 2. Okay, so we can find rather trivially, trivially the roots for this. We note that f of 1 is 0. When we plug in a 1, we get 1 minus 3 plus 2. And also f of 2 is 0. So 2 squared is 4 minus 6 plus 2 is also equal to 0. So 1 and 2 are roots of f. Okay, because those, those particular values get you 0. Okay. Another example, let's say f of x is ax squared plus bx plus c, and we want to find the roots, so we'll use the quadratic formula. So we'll say that this has to be equal to 0, so therefore b minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a has to equal the roots. Okay. So if we have b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, then there is only one root, and that root will be minus b over 2a. If b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0, then we have two roots. And if it's less than 0, we have no roots. Okay. We studied this back in chapter 4 when we learned about how to solve quadratic formulas. Theorem 1. Theorem 1 of this section states, let f be a polynomial, f is a polynomial of degree less than or equal to n. Okay, so it goes up to the a n to x to the n term, and c is a root. Okay, so f of c is equal to 0. There is a polynomial is a function g, which is a polynomial, and it has degree less than or equal to n minus 1, okay, such that f of x is x minus c, that's the root, times g of x, okay. So when we subtract, when we take, when we factor out x minus c from f, we're going to get g of x left over. Okay, so here's the proof. Okay, the first thing he does is he writes this out. He says f of x is equal to a0 plus a1 times x plus a2x squared plus dot 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 plus a to the n x to the n. Okay, now if we substitute x, is equal to x minus c plus c. So we're just subtracting c and adding it back in. Okay. Then we can rewrite this as f of x minus c, let's put that in parentheses, plus c is equal to a0 plus a1 times x minus c plus c. I wrote a backward c there. 
plus a2 times x minus c plus c squared plus dot 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 plus a to the n times x minus c plus c to the nth power. Okay. And we note that when we expand this out, so when we take uh, x minus c plus c to the kth power, where k is some integer less than n, okay, then this is going to give you something where you have x minus c to the k plus dot 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 plus something, and then it's going to have the plus c to the k power at the end. Okay, we're not going to solve the middle bits. Okay, we just know that that's what's going to happen. Now, because of this fact, we're going to note that we can rewrite this entire formula. And this is the tricky part. So um, he's going to say that we can rewrite f of x into this new form where we have b0 plus b1 times x minus c plus b2 times x minus c squared plus dot 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 plus b to the n times x minus c to the nth power. Okay, why is he able to do this? Well, it involves a little bit of hand waving, but not much, okay? So this term here will give you x minus c to the nth plus blah, 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 okay? There'll be an x plot minus c to the k, uh, n minus one, and x plus c to the n minus two, etc., etc. okay? This term here will give you, at the very least, it's gonna give you an x minus c to the first power, right? plus some constant, okay? And so we can reorganize things into this form because we can now have factors of x minus c in this expression, okay? Note, however, that f of c is equal to zero because c is a root, okay? And if we put f of c in there, then this becomes zero, that becomes zero, that becomes zero, because c minus c is zero. And so this is also equal to b zero. So b0 is 0. So this term is a 0, in fact. So this is the combination of a0 plus all of these uh, a1 c squared, a1 times c, a2 times c squared, a3 times c to the cube, a n times c to the n. Okay, it's a combination of all those. Now, we can rewrite, and I'm going to use one more line for this and then a new piece of paper. So we can rewrite f of x to be b1 times x minus c. So we're going to factor out x minus c. So we're going to have b1 plus b2 times x minus c plus dot, 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 plus bn times x minus c to the n minus 1. Okay? So we factored out this x minus c term because b0 is 0. So the b1 goes here without any coefficient. b2 goes here with only to the first power and then bn goes here with the n minus one power. Okay, so we've rewritten f of x in this form. Okay, so we factored out that x minus c. Okay, and then that will give us basically the answer. And so now we can say that f of x is equal to x minus c times g of x, where g of x is defined to be these b1s plus b0 times x minus c plus dot 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 plus b to the n times x minus c to the n minus 1. Okay, so that's what g of x is defined to be. All right, so we've proven this. So g of x is a polynomial. It has degree maximum of n minus 1, and you can multiply g of x times x minus c and get back f of x. So we've proven all of the conditions for our theorem. Okay, so f of x is x minus c times some g of x, and g of x is this, in fact, function. Okay? Now, here's a little question, a little side remark comment that he makes. He says that when we did this expansion, you'll note that this largest term, let me kind of go through it. So this largest term, a to the n times x minus c plus c to the n. So the a to the n is actually the same as b to the n. Okay? Because of this because there's no other term contributing to that b n term. So he notes a to the n is equal to b to the n, right? Not for all n, but for that maximum n. So that last term here is the same as that last term. The coefficient of the last term in the g of x is the same as the coefficient for the last term in the f of x. All right. 
So we can rewrite g of x is the same as a to the n from f of x times x minus c to the n minus 1, and then we have these other lower terms, which are combinations of the various other a's. Okay, and he says this will be useful later, so we'll do that later. Theorem 2. We'll continue Theorem 2 in the next video. Guys, take care and enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on Sergey Lang's Basic Mathematics. You can find the series on the left, and on the right, you can click to support my channel. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.